Welcome to the 46th meeting of the Fair Employment and Housing Council. Uh, the meeting is being called to order. I'll have my colleague, Rachel Langston, Senior Fair Employment and Housing Council, conduct the roll call. Kevin Kish. Present. Gabriel Sandoval. Present. Uh, Council Member Brodsky. Present. Council Member Helen Hong. Present. Council Member Tim Iglesias. Present. Council Member Edetunji, sorry, Edetunji Olude. Present. Council Member Dara Schur. Present. Council Member Julie Wilinski. Present. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to the public. This meeting is being webcast live via Zoom video conference, and the video of this meeting will also be available afterwards on the DFEH website and the DFEH YouTube channel. We also have closed caption available for participants, which can find at the bottom of the Zoom bar features. If you're having difficulty accessing closed captioning, you can also chat with the administrator to resolve this particular issue. Members of the public who may have noticed that you are currently muted and your video is disabled at this time. However, please be advised there will be opportunities for public comment and participation throughout today's meeting as we address each of our agenda items. We have a number of ways for you to provide input and comments. You can email the council at fehcouncil, C-O-U-N-C-I-L, at dfeh.ca.gov. We will be checking this email account throughout the meeting today, and your comments will be read aloud and considered by the council members. Alternatively, you can use the Zoom chat feature to send a message directly to the meeting administrator who can read your comment out loud. Or if you would like to speak directly rather than through your written text, please click raise hand in Zoom or press star nine if you have called in. If you would like to rename yourself in the Zoom list of participants, you can find yourself on the list and click rename in the list of options next to your name. I'd like to also introduce and acknowledge uh, department uh, members who are joining us today. Uh, Kevin Kish, who already has been introduced as the director of the department. Adam Romero, DFEH's deputy director of executive programs. Rachel Langston, senior fair employment and housing council as well as Mario Block, Senior Fair Employment and Housing Council, who is a new member of our team. So uh, Ms. Block, would you like to introduce yourself for the public and to identify your experience? Sure, thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here. My name is Mariel Block. I'm a new Senior um, Fair Employment and Housing Council with the FEH. Um, my background's in housing. I've worked in housing for the past nine years, uh, most recently at the National Housing Law Project which is a national legal aid um, support center and federal policy advocacy agency. And before that, I was a legal aid housing attorney. Um, so I'm just really happy to be here and really look forward to um, supporting the council in your work. Welcome, we look forward to working with you. Um, we also like to, at this time, identify and review the items of the agenda. Uh, copies of the agenda and meeting materials can be accessed at the council's page of the DFH website. Highlight of today's meetings will include a report from our director, Kevin Kish, as well as consideration of proposed modifications to employment regulations regarding criminal history. And then we'll have an opportunity to hear from our uh, respective subcommittees on issues that they are working on. So uh, the first order of business that we have is a review of and approval of the minutes, which are attachment A. So at this time, uh, do any of our uh, council members have comments or edits regarding the minutes from our last meeting? Okay. Any public comments regarding the minutes? Uh, it does not appear that, sorry. It, okay. It does not appear that there are any public comments. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, can we have a motion to adopt the minutes? So moved. A second, please. I second. Roll call. Director Kish? He doesn't vote. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, under, I'm a non voting member non -voting of the council. Non voting member. I apologize. Um, um, uh, Chairperson Sandoval? Aye. Uh, council Member Brodsky? Aye. Council Member Hong? Aye. Council Member Iglesias? Aye. Council Member Lude? Aye. Council Member Schur? 
abstain since I wasn't at the meeting. Council Member Walensky. Aye. Great. Uh, they have been adopted. Next, we're going to move on to our next item on the agenda, and that's a report from uh, Kevin Kish. Hi, everyone. Um, happy to be here in our first council meeting of 2022. I just have a couple of things that I'd like to share with folks. Um, and the first, I'd, I'd just like to once again put a spotlight and acknowledgement on Mariel Block and Rachel Langston. This is the first meeting in the council's history where we have two um, lawyers at DFBH who are supporting the work of the council. It's been really wonderful to welcome Rachel and Mariel on board. I'm so happy that we now have this additional support. And I know Adam um, shares my happiness in particular with, uh, with the work that Rachel and Mariel are doing. So thank you guys. Um, I, I know that our subcommittees will report on regulatory actions, but I wanted to just at the outset say that as we know, um, the fair housing regulations were approved by OAL and went into effect on January 1st. And I encourage folks to register for our free webinar series that will begin uh, at the end of this month and will continue throughout the spring discussing the regulations and their impact on Californians. Uh, also, the Office of Administrative Law approved changes without regulatory effect to the California Family Rights Act regulations that Council Member Brodsky moved forward. Um, that means that there is an updated regulatory notice. It's a required posting for employers in California to put in workplaces informing employees of their rights around um, family and medical leave. Uh, in the past month, we have released a new fact sheet in multiple languages um, about how fair housing laws protect child care providers. This is a um, little understood aspect of fair housing law, but California law protects the right of Californians to um, run uh, licensed child care operations out of their homes, including apartments notwithstanding any local zoning or other rules. Um, so this is a really, for me, an important right. Um, it's a little bit more personal to me than some other things. My mother was a home child care provider and I grew up in a home um, where she was providing full-time care to other people's children. And so I know, um, first of all, that uh, folks who have children right now are particularly impacted by the pandemic and by school closures and other restrictions on life. I know what um, reliable and trustworthy care can mean for a family. I know what the economic impact of um, being able to provide that care is for the family of the child care provider. And I personally think that having access to reliable and affordable child care is a human right. So I'm very pleased that the department has put out this um, uh, fact sheet uh, letting people know. Um, the two other things that I wanted to flag, one, uh, we are entering, now that we're in uh, 2022, the second year of pay data reporting. Um, as folks, I think, are generally aware, the California legislature last year uh, created a statutory requirement for large employers of 100 or more employees with at least one employee in California to report pay and demographic data of their workforces to DFEH. And we successfully completed the first year of data collection. Starting on February 1st, our portal will be open for the second year of data collection. And please keep an eye out for updated FAQs and templates the filing uh, deadline this year is April 1st, uh, 2022. So I encourage folks to get that done as soon as possible. And then finally, I just wanted to flag for everyone that um, we have posted on DFEH's website, our annual report from 2020. Um, not 2021, we aren't there yet, but 2020, <laughs> which I think has some really interesting information for people about what we were able to do during a year of crisis and pandemic, including a very significant expansion of our education and outreach efforts that reached more than 17,000 individual Californians. 
Um, the other tidbit that I'd like to share for the public uh, is that our mediation program showed no change in the success rate of mediations when we went from in-person mediations to remote mediations. And I think this runs a little bit against conventional wisdom about how mediations are effective. And so I find it very interesting. I think private mediators are finding similar uh, data in their practices, but from the state level, we can certainly see that there has been no um, decrease in the success rate of our mediations. And so I encourage folks who are engaged in the DFEH process to take advantage of that service. And that's what I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, Director Kish. At this time, I'm going to ask any uh, council members if they have any reports that they'd like to share at this time. Okay. I see none. Uh, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is consideration of proposed modifications to employment regulations regarding criminal history. Before I turn this over to my colleague, uh, Council Member Julie Walensky, I wanted to let the public know that this is the beginning of the regulatory process if the Council adopts the proposed regulations. That would be then followed by a 45-day comment period and further hearings and comments. So before um, I turn it over, I just wanted to make clear to the public that this is the commencement of the process if, in fact, the Council decides to adopt the proposed regulations. Uh, as drafted at this time. Uh, Councilmember Walensky, would you like to go over the uh, items in the regulations, the proposed regulations? Sure, Pardon. thank you, Chair Sandoval. And, um, and just to reiterate, we're seeking approval today to start the rulemaking process. Um, and so um, we're looking forward to feedback. Um, I also want to thank Root and Rebound for providing written comments at the last council meeting and also um, those who shared their expertise at the hearing in 2020. Um, I'm going to give a very brief overview um, and then just walk through some of the proposed changes. So just as an overview, um, the subcommittee proposes adding a subsection on the work opportunity tax credit to provide guidance for employers when seeking those credits. And we also are proposing some clarifying edits to the existing regulations, which includes moving some subsections. Um, and so in some places, what looks like completely new text in the black line is just text that has been moved. Um, so I just wanted to flag that. And with that, I'm just gonna walk through um, the major um, proposed changes today. So I'm starting um, with the, um, the black line that is attachment B to the meeting materials. And um, we propose adding an introduction to just provide an overview of this, um, of the regulation. Subsection A, um, we added, um, we broke it, it, we suggest breaking it into subparagraphs for additional clarity. Paragraph two um, is new. And um, the subsection that follows on labor contractors, union hiring halls, and client employers, which used to be B, is moved. And, and is it possible to share a screen or for Rachel to share a screen so that we can, um, so that it's on the screen at the same time you're describing this? Is that yeah, feasible? I can do that. It will take me just a moment if that's. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Should I pause until until that's up? May I ask a process question? Uh, do you want um, feedback as we go along, or do you want us to wait at the end? How would you like us to engage, if at all? Um, that is a great question. Um, I think I, my plan was to do a short walkthrough of the changes and then seek feedback from the council on um, any part, and then and then we would seek feedback from the public. Is that perfect? Thank you. And may I, I'm just going to um, weigh in because we actually haven't introduced a new package in a while to help people understand what actions can come. So. At the end of the presentation, the plan of the subcommittee 
is to present the text for a vote to the council to move it into public rulemaking, which once published by OAL um, will create the, uh, the uh, public comment period, the first 45 day public comment period during which people can write in and formally um, comment on the text. So if there are um, small changes, typos, things like that, the council can vote to um, incorporate those into the text that we're seeing today and move that revised text forward. If there are major concerns, I think there are two options. One is you could recommend to the subcommittee um, that the package not move forward without further revision, or you could vote it down um, so that they have to do that. Uh, or if there are kind of substantive comments, but you don't have a problem with the structure that's been presented today, you could wait for the actual public comment period um, for those uh, comments to be considered by the subcommittee as part of the formal rulemaking process. Thank you, Director Kish. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so um, I'll just I'll just start with the I'll go back to the walkthrough and uh, where we were was the um, strikeout of what used to be section B. Um, and we just suggest moving that. And um, the reason is that we thought it would be helpful to follow A directly with um, what was C and what would be now be moved to B. Um, so moving down on the page two of the document, um, looking at the proposed section B, we proposed um, uh, revising the language of the title of that subsection because um, the content is not limited to the time period after a conditional offer has been made. And we um, proposed adding additional text um, prior to making a conditional offer for clarification because the um, labor codes provisions apply then as well. Um, moving down to what is proposed section C, which starts at the bottom of that page. Um, here, we propose further subdividing it for clarity. And so that's just breaking out long paragraphs into um, sub smaller paragraphs um, to kind of break out some of the points in that um, subsection. And we also throughout added references to the department's forms, which we think could be helpful tools in this process. Um, in paragraph 2D, which is at the bottom of page 4 and the top of page 5, um, we are suggesting adding additional examples of evidence of rehabilitation or mitigating circumstances and um, using language similar to what's in the housing regulations. And we also um, suggest providing some examples of documentary evidence as well. Um, looking down to C3, so I also, sorry, just process-wise, there are a couple places where um, I've seen some typos or like that level of modifications that I want to suggest. Um, so I can, um, maybe I'll just flag that. There's only a couple of them. But um, C3 says, shall notify the applicant in a writing, um, would suggest just omitting the A. So it says, shall notify the applicant in writing. Um, moving down to subsection D, uh, that's labor contractors, union hiring halls, and client employers. That's the bottom of page five and goes on to page six. Um, that just got moved. So although it looks like it's completely new language in the formatting of the black line, it just got moved from where it used to be um, in B. And the only substantive change is taking the definitions out to put them in a separate subsection. And that is because the definitions um, that were previously under that subsection applied to the, um, this section of the regulations as a whole. Um, a tiny 
um, non-substantive modification I'd like to make to D4 is that in the last sentence, it ends with subsection A4. I think that should be paragraph A4 just for consistency on that. Um, moving down to um, subsection F, which starts on page six, and that's the su um, subsection on adverse impact. Uh, the subcommittee proposes um, changing to applicants or employees throughout for consistency and further subdividing into paragraphs for clarity. Um, another tiny non-substantive typographical modification to the version that's been posted is under paragraph two, I think it should be a black line under the two because the, the new paragraphs um, subdividing into paragraphs is new. Um, within that paragraph, which is F2, um, we're proposing some clarifying changes to the text regarding the cross-reference to the regulations and the uniform guidelines. We also suggested um, omitting the sentence at the end that the applicants or employees bear the burden because that is now a standalone subparagraph immediately above. So that um, remains in its own subsection. And um, we also propose some additional clarifying edits to the subsection and the paragraph on um, less discriminatory alternatives was just moved. It was not changed. Um, and we wanted to we wanted to propose moving that to be within the adverse impact section. Um, moving down to subsection G, and I'm looking at page seven of the PDF, um, that we did not propose any changes to. Um, right below that is what uh, is the, the st struck out less, discrimin less discriminatory alternative section that just got moved up. Um, we're not proposing um, edits to the text there. And then um, subsection H is new. And um, that is intended to harmonize the Fair Chance Act with the processes for claiming the work opportunity tax credit. And so it provides guidance to employers on um, the processes for seeking those credits. And um, finally, little i um, are definitions and those just got um, moved into their own separate section as they were underneath the client employer section, but, but applied more generally to the regulation. And um, let's see, finally, um, I will add that in this current proposal, um, we did not propose um, potential changes to the use of the terms criminal history and conviction history, as well as the term rebuttable defenses. Those are terms that are used in the current regulation. Um, but we would, if we proceed with for formal rulemaking, we would encourage feedback um, during the comment period on the use of those terms. And so this is just an overview um, of the proposal. And we are very much looking forward to um, feedback from the council and the public. Thank you. Can I jump in? So thank you very much. This is really good work. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of things. One is um, I'm not sure why the definitions are at the end if they apply to this whole section. It seems more helpful to a reader to have the definitions all at the front, at the top of the um, regulation instead of at the end, since the 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 definitions are of terms that are being used in the regulation. I, that was one of my comments I was going to make as well, that it seems like those should be up at, at front. And I think in the other regulations, other sets of regulations, the definitions always are first. Okay. 
I, and that seems like that might be, I mean, I don't know, you know, what you think, but it could be, it seems like it's a non-substantive change that just could be, you know, pick it up and just make it, um, put it up front as A, and it would be non-substantive change, but that's for DFEH to, I mean, is that, is that, would that be a non-substantive change? Part of, part of the discussion we had in terms of where to place it was the fact that if we were to change where the definitions were to be placed, uh, there may be some uh, uh, related effect in terms of how other sections may be related in other materials or other sections. But I, I think that either if it's placed in the front or in the end, uh, you would have the same impact. But uh, I understand what both you and uh, Councilmember Iglesias are raising as an issue. I, um, I have a, a number of little things that can wait until later, but the only other thing that, that might be more important is um, it is towards the end. So I don't, I'm not sure if, you know, uh, Councilman Wilinski, you want to sort of walk through the page by page and get comments or, or just take all comments at once. I'm not sure. Um, I think I, either way is fine with me, just process wise, um, I'm, keeping track of them and I can I can do it um, either way. Okay, so uh, like I said, I have some smaller like word changes, but that can be, wait for later. But the only thing that if I'm, uh, that might be valuable is on page seven um, in the section E, uh, capital letter E, um, it asks or it allows the impacted uh, individual notice um, to present evidence that the information is factually inaccurate. And I'm wondering if to make that parallel to the prior section, they should also be able to present evidence of, of um, rehabilitation or of mitigating circumstances and all, in other words, to parallel the kind of information that they are able to provide under section small c uh, 1d on page 4. So just to make sure I'm understanding um, your question. So you're looking at, are you looking at what is F on page five? What is capital F? Let's see. I, um, let's see what I thought I was for uh, or at is, um, let's see, page, it's on page, the, the part that I think may need to be revised is on page seven, and I'm thinking it should be parallel um, to the section that was just being shown in terms of what kind of evidence should a person who uh, might be disqualified be able to present. Oh, okay. I see the I see the spot now. Sorry, I was looking at the previous page. Yeah. And this is in the adverse impact. Yeah. So I'm just process wise. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm thinking about this in real time. Would it make sense to go through um, your other comments and then and then come back to this for discussion? Or is there I think, like I said, discussion? my other comments are just word word smithing that I think can wait. And if it, assuming it goes into um, uh, a rulemaking thing, I can make them in the first draft. I, I don't think any of them are very important. 
can I also, I just have a clarifying question, um, Council Member Iglesias, about moving your suggestion to move the definitions. Would, would they be moved to above the introduction? I think that's where most, uh, it, in my experience, that's where most, usually that's where they're located, to sort of orient the reader so that they know what the definitions are going forward. So it would, unfortunately, <laughs> require restructuring or renumbering a lot. Can you scroll back up to the very beginning? So I would say that the definitions would go after the introduction. Inter yeah, that makes sense. After the introduction. Thank you. Any additional comments, uh, Council Member Iglesias, other than the word smithing you suggested you would provide once um, this goes into formal? I, I just had one that could be just, it's a non-substantive change. It could just be done today, just for clarification. Go ahead, Council Member. It's in B, um, if you could scroll down to B, but there's something else on the screen right now. B, um, Oh, it, here it is. Prohibition, uh, sorry, it's an A. Prohibition it might be also in B. On consideration, it seems to me it should be prohibit, prohibition against consideration. I don't think on is the right preposition for that. But it would, it's a non-substantive change. You, or pro prohibition of consideration. Um, that's a little more awkward. So just... You know, if, if I mean, it could wait too as you as you edit for the for the next version. But if you wanted to just change it now because it's non-substantive, you could. I think it makes sense to change to of. Makes sense. It might be also in B because I'd made a note that it was in B too. Is it? Look, can we go down to little B? I'm not sure. What. Right. It also says prohibition on. Yeah, yeah. So we could also change that to of. Right. Anything else, Councilman Broski? Just no, that's for now, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to <laughs> Councilmember Hong. Thank you, Chair Sandoval. Um, I think my, I just, ha I think this is great. I think my only question uh, was in terms of on page five, um, when it comes to notice of withdrawal based on the report, um, the question was, it, it's, it, it still reads as if it's going to be a written letter and whether or not there was any thought, like why not adding email? <laughs> Um, and samples of that, just because so much of this now is never on a, a mailing address. And so by the time someone may get that and try to execute it, whether or not there was any thought about including there has to be a way to contact uh, via email the employer or um, in terms of making that a little bit more, I think, practical in terms of direction. Does that make sense? So I'm looking at, I'm sorry. Um, it's on page five, section uh, big E, little, double little I, and then F. So whether or not there was thought to add more language uh, to include a uh, person to contact and or uh, email along with sample. That was, I think, my question. Um, thank you for flagging that. I um, would want to take another look at the statute um, okay. to see what it says about the form of um, the notice. Oh, sorry. Hold on. 
Okay, and then um, just as a smaller note then, the other question, um, just as an edit in terms of page five, little two uh, eyes, um, the list of examples of people who can provide character um, rehabilitation. So I thought the first full paragraph under documentary evidence may include whether or not we could also include case managers just because that seems like you're you're including a lot of terms of um, of titles and generally I think case managers either will apply to DV shelters, homeless shelters, and or most social service providers um, who may not fit into a, a counselor or a specific role that's listed here. That's something we could just include today and just uh, it, when we vote on it, just with that with that change. Otherwise, I'm happy to, um, yeah, if it's not, I don't think that it's substantive, so, but uh, if it's a problem, then I can hold on to the next version of the revision. No, oh, I mean, I, I was asking DFVH because it would be easy to do. I mean, it seems like that would be a good thing to add. It, it doesn't matter whether a change is, at this stage, is substantive or not, as long as we're clear about what the final text is that is being voted on. So what we'll do is, assuming the subcommittee asks the council for a vote, vote, we can go through and name any changes to the text that the council will be voting on. So if you decide you want to add case manager to the list, which um, as a non-voting member, I would uh, support, I don't see a reason not to, uh, then you can say that um, before taking the vote so that the text that the council votes on reflects that change. Right. And I don't see any reason why we couldn't add case managers to the list. And thank you. Agreed. That was it. Thank you. Council Member Hong, do you have anything else? No, that's it. Thank you. Council Member Schur. Uh, thank you for this package. It, it looks good. Um, my first class, I thought, wow, it's a lot of changes. But now I, I understand um, and appreciate the, the attempts to reorganize and clarify some existing provisions as well as add a few new things. Um, I, I have two questions. Um, one is mostly because my head is still in the housing regs. Um, you indicated that at the current time, the definition, some of the definitions are not the same as the ones in the criminal history regs in housing, but you, is, did I understand that correctly? Um, I, I was saying that in the list of mitigating um, ah. or rehabilitation evidence, some of the language that we added is um, tracks the language in the housing regulations, but not verbatim. And so an example is um, whether the conduct arose from the applicant's disability or disabilities, and also whether the conduct arose from the applicant's status as a survivor of domestic violence and um, similar offenses. And the language is similar, but not verbatim to the housing regulations. Um, so I just wanted to flag that. Thank you. I, I, I don't, I'd have to go back. So if, if I have any concerns, I'll raise them during the public comment or at the next meeting. Um, and then I know the burden of proof is different in housing. And I don't know if you had looked at that or if that's something we should provide more comment on at the next stage. We didn't address that issue. We can provide more comment in the next stage, I would imagine. Okay. I will look at those two issues in, in regards um, to the next stage, assuming we vote it forward. Um, Anyone else? Let's go to see if everybody on the screen. Oh, may I respond quickly to council member sure to your question about the burdens of proof. And so we didn't compare the, stru the structure of the burdens of proof um, with a lens to, to distinguish from housing, but we also did not propose any language, new language that would change um, the nature of the inquiry um, under these regulations and under the statute. Yes, thank you. Um... I know under the housing regulations, if I'm not mistaken, um, 
the burden is on the employee, the respondent to establish the least restrictive alternative uh, to show that there is no other alternative um, to show if there is another alternative. But I don't know, I haven't looked at it closely enough to know if the statutory schemes would permit that change. So I can get back to you on that. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Any further comment from any council members? Councilmember Sure, you have your hand raised. Is, is that are you? Sorry, I didn't take it down. No worries. Thank you. Any public comment? There is public comment. Okay. Uh, Noah Lebowitz asked me to share on behalf of um, the California Employment Lawyers Association Regulations Committee um, because many of the proposed changes are reorganizing as opposed to substantive new language. It would be very helpful for those of us reviewing the package for purposes of engaging in the public comment period if the council were to include a chart in the initial statement of reasons or otherwise within the notice package designating the particular sections as either substantive or reorganization without substantive change. Okay. Thank you. Any other additional comment? It does not, oh, sorry, there is a hand raised. Um, Molly Lau, let me, okay, Molly, you're, um, you should be unmuted or there you go. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Molly Lau and I'm a Skadden Fellow with Legal Aid at Work's Racial Economic Justice Program. And uh, as part of our work, we assist individuals with prior convictions in their employment issues. So first, I just wanted to applaud the council for these proposed regulations, which um, especially adding clarifying language constituting a non-exhaustive list of the types of evidence, including documentary evidence that may demonstrate an applicant's rehabilitation or mitigating circumstances in subsection C. We also appreciate the language in subsection C2E, which adds that employer may offer an applicant more than five business days to respond. And then there are also other few proposals that we wanted to make. Um, we would urge the council to consider adopting clarifying language in sub subsection A4 to avoid confusion with these regulations and other labor code and occupational licensing laws. We would propose the council insert additional language explaining the scope of the exemption. So for example, the following language could be added after the first sentence in subsection A4A. To be exempted, the employer or the employer's agent itself must be required by law to conduct the criminal background check. A state, federal, or local law requiring that another entity, like an occup occupational licensing board, con conduct a criminal background check will not exempt an employer. Additionally, the council could also define laws that restrict employment based on criminal history, which is referenced in subsection A4D, to be those that prohibit an individual with that particular conviction from holding the position sought by the applicant or where the employer is prohibited by law from hiring an applicant who has that particular conviction. Um, and re we're referencing Labor Code Section 432.7, M1, C, and D. Another proposal we are suggesting is to modify the language in subsection F4D of the draft regulations concerning the notice to an adversely impacted applicant of the reasons for their exclusion. So rather than simply notifying the applicant that they have been screened out because of a criminal conviction, we believe that the applicant's ability to respond effectively to the disqualification would be far more meaningful if the employer were required to, one, to specify if more than one conviction appeared on the background report, which convictions were found disqualifying, and two, to provide reasoning as to why they were found disqualifying. Instead of the bare knowledge that a conviction was disqualifying, one and two taken together, would enable the unsuccessful applicant to provide a more informed response. We also propose that the council consider adopting clarifying language that all relief generally available under the FIHA is also available under AB 1008 government code section 12952. 
So in addition to these proposed modifications to the draft regulations, we also ask to consider in entering into cross-filing agreements with local jurisdictions, such as San Francisco and Los Angeles, which have enacted parallel ordinances protecting applicants with criminal convictions from unlawful discrimination. And finally, we uh, may make more recommendations to the regulatory changes in our formal written public comment, but those are the changes, uh, suggestions we have from Legal Aid at work today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments and also thank you to Mr. Lebowitz for your comments earlier. Rachel, any additional public comments? No, it doesn't appear there are any additional public comments. Okay. But at this time, uh, would it be best to identify the changes we talked about and then determine whether or not there would be uh, a motion with those amendments made to move forward with the rulemaking process? Does that work? Okay. Um, so do you want to categorize, uh, Councilmember Walensky, your initial changes in the, the items you identified, the removal of A, I believe, in certain of the sections, and then we'll move forward with other changes and suggestions that were made by our council members? Sure. So um, I'll just, so I suggested three non-substantive edits. One is in C3, where it says, shall notify the applicant in A writing, just removing A. Um, the second is in D4 to change in the last sentence where it says subsection A4 to change to paragraph A4, just for consistency with how we're referring to that level of sub um, topic. And then finally, this is just typographical, but um, under, um, under F2, there should be black line under the two because the subsection or paragraph is new. And that's just typographical. Okay. Uh, and then I, I made a list of the other suggestions. Should sure. I just go through those one okay. by one? Okay. Um, and just acknowledging, um, going back to Mr. Lebowitz's comment, um, I appreciate how hard it is to tell what's changed in the way that the black line appears. And um, I apologize for that because it, it looks like there are many more changes than there were and it can be hard to parse out what is different. Um, but so just moving to the suggestions that were made, um, um, Council Member Iglesias suggested and Council Member Brodsky suggested moving the definition section, um, which is currently at the end, to go after the introduction. And I don't, process-wise, should we address these one by one? Is that? Sure. Is this something that, is this the kind of change that could be made it also in the formal comment period? It can be, uh, but if we could get to some of the changes that have been identified, I think I don't think that there's too many. Uh, we could do that as well. And then any additional comments or changes can be made during the formal rulemaking process. So we, we have, do you, do you have anything else on the list? I, I have some additional things. Oh, oh, sure, sorry. I wasn't sure if we were, so, so there was the, um, suggestion to put the definitions after the introduction. And then um, a more substantive suggestion from council member Iglesias under the adverse impact inquiry, capital E on whether um, the notice should, where it says factually inaccurate should parallel um, the discussion in the previous subsection in terms of rehabilitating and um, mitigating circumstances. Is that right, Council Member Iglesias? Yes. And so my, my reaction to that would be that's something I would wanna look into more um, rather than adopting on the fly um, and would request that we um, keep that feedback in mind but not adopt it in real time today. That's okay with me. Great. Okay. Um, and then council member Brodsky um, for sections A and B where it says consideration 
on, sorry, consideration of uh, to change, sorry, prohibition of should be changed to prohibition on. That was the opposite, prohibition on to prohibition of. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chair Sandoval. Um, so yes, just as Chair Sandoval just said. We can just make that global change if that appears somewhere else in the, in the document. Okay. okay. Um, and then the next one was um, Council Member Hong's suggestion that had to do with making the notice, the written notice um, more practical by including reference or requirement of email or other ways of reaching the person. Um, and that is also a suggestion that I think is, um, would, would I would wanna look into that more and also look at the statutory language as well. And so that's something I would also suggest that we take under consideration and not adopt in real time. Aye. Okay. Um, I think, and then Council Member Hong also suggested where there's a list of types of documentary evidence adding case managers. And I think we should um, add that and that's easy to do in, uh, while we're here today. Agreed. Um, Council Member Hong, did you have a spot in that list? Um. I think you can put it anywhere uh, where it says like near counselor, I would just put it right after counselor. Okay. So the suggestion would be to add it right after um, counselors. Sorry, in the clause about, um, just to be really precise about where we would put it, um, counselors, um, it's on the, in the clause about documentation from healthcare provider counselors exactly. or victim advocates. Okay. Correct, correct. So it would be there. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just making sure um, that my notes are here. Um, and then um, we also received comments from um, Mr. Lebowitz on behalf of SELA and from Ms. Lau on behalf of Legal Aid at Work. And um, the nature of these comments, I think, lends itself to um, further consideration if we move forward with the rulemaking process. Um, I see some heads nodding. Um, yes. Okay, so I think the only um, open issue is whether to move the definitions. Um, that's something that I do not have strong feelings about, but I think I would still prefer to, to think more on. Chair Sandoval, what do you think? Well, what is uh, the department feedback on that particular issue in terms of my sense is that if there's movement, there's going to be a ripple effect in terms of other types of items. Mm -hmm. But I, I do suggest that we change it to the front, but wanted to get some feedback from Director Kish on that. The definitions in this proposed draft are already moved, correct or no? Correct. Yeah. They were moved out of a sub. They were moved exactly. out of a subsection yeah. on client. Labor. So the whole um, section is is going to be open for public comment either way. Um, I think that you all had a considered approach to this. I think that uh, Chair, um, Council Member Iglesias's comments are well taken, which is typically uh, definitions appear up front, but I don't see any harm, frankly, either way. And for sake of administrative ease, I would propose um, moving the package to a vote with as few amendments as possible. And if during the initial um, consideration of the 45-day comments, the subcommittee determines that they want to move the definitions, it doesn't do anything except um, create a another comment period, which I can't imagine we wouldn't have anyway, given some of the comments that we've heard today. So I don't see any delay in um, postponing that decision. Okay. Thank you, Director Kish. All right. Um, 
So at this time, uh, no no public comments, no additional public comments after Frederick Kish spoke? No, there are not. Okay. So uh, can I uh, solicit a motion to adopt uh, the proposed regulations with the amendments that have been identified by uh, Council Member uh, Wilensky? So moved. Can I have a second, please? Second. Thank you. Can you get a roll call, please? Chair Sandoval? Aye. Council Member Brodsky? Aye. Council Member Hong? Aye. Council Member Iglesias? Aye. Council Member Lude? Aye. Council Member Schur? Aye. Council Member Walensky? Aye. Great, thank you so much. Um, next on the agenda, we have uh, an update from our Reasonable Accommodations for Associational Disability Subcommittee. I'll turn that over to uh, council members Alude and Brodsky. Thank you, Chair Sandoval. Um, the Associational Disability Subcommittee uh, doesn't have um, new developments to report, but did wanna um, check in with the department to see if there was additional information um, regarding the, the subcommittee. Is that me? <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I don't have additional information at this time. Um, you know, although we are, are, we are working to determine whether, uh, there is support for the package to move forward. And this maybe gives me a little bit of an opportunity um, to discuss two things. And one is timeline. I have felt, and I think uh, some of the council members have felt some frustration with timelines and the ability to move forward packages that they have worked on, including this one. And um, I learned from our oversight agency, the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency that on packages that um, for other agencies and departments, the average time period for movement is five years from the inception of the idea to final approval by OAL, most of which as we know um, is pre-introduction because uh, once a rulemaking package is moved to OAL, there's only one year to complete it. So I offer that um, as uh, cold comfort <laughs> to folks who are waiting for uh, movement on things uh, that there's simply a lot of kind of internal debate. Um, the department is not the only, and the council are not the only uh, folks who weigh in. Um, there are, under the, uh, the Administrative Procedures Act, there are a number of technical compliance um, steps that we have to engage in, including um, forms that have to be signed not only by the department, but by our oversight agency, by the Department of Finance. So all of this means is that when a regulatory package moves, it moves with the support and alignment of the entire executive branch. Um, so this idea, as you know, is uh, not everybody agrees. Our stakeholders are not all aligned. And certainly that doesn't mean that we don't take action. Um, we can and do and have in the past, but this one um, we're simply uh, continuing to discuss and get feedback on, and unfortunately, we don't have a different update for right now. Thank you, Director Kish. You. Any additional comment from council members? Any public comment? There's no public comment on this matter. Thank you. We'll go to next to the Next uh, agenda item, which is a criminal history and employment regulation subcommittee. I know we just talked about uh, the proposed modifications, but does any council member want to speak on a matter uh, that's different or related to that issue of criminal history and employment regulations? Okay. Any additional public comment, Rachel? There's no public comment. Okay. So we're going to move next uh, to the next uh, item on the agenda, which is an update from the Government Code Section 11135 Regulation Subcommittee. I'll turn it over to Dale Brodsky and Dara Schur, Council Members. Thank you, Chair. Um, we, I, I really appreciate Director Kish's comments. Um, I know many of us, and 
including Councilman Lombrowski and I have been very frustrated at the pace of moving these regulations, but um, it is a huge complicated package with a lot of issues affecting a lot of people and a lot of different agencies. And um, all I can say at the moment is it is still under administrative review and um, we continue to be highly optimistic, um, but it is just taking a long time. And keep in mind that it also, you know, got moved forward during the pandemic when all kinds of things slowed down. So we are trying very hard to, to, to do what we can to move this as fast as we can, but um, it is currently still under review. Yeah, mute, Chair. Thank you. Uh, any additional comments from other council members? Any public comment? There are no public comments on this matter. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which is an update from the subcommittee regarding hate violence. Uh, turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Councilman Brodsky. I was going to turn it over to you. <laughs> oh, there you, go. Oh, you want to turn it over to me? That's fine. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, an update. Uh, we have been working with um, the DFEH and our colleague Adam Romero on uh, items of uh, uh, ways to identify um, opportunities for education on hate violence and how to prevent it. And that's ongoing. Uh, how do we ensure that this particular issue is addressed in a, a, in a full, fully comprehensive way. And that is obviously through public outreach and education, which the um, Fair Employment and Housing Council and the department have been focused on for the last several years because of the tremendous increase of crime and other types of hate incidents related to issues of Asian Americans and Pacific Islands, but other communities as well. Um, but part of the issue uh, that we identified during our their Employment Housing Council on this very issue uh, several years ago uh, was the fact that sometimes individuals who are victims of uh, these types of incidents, hate incidents and crimes, don't understand that there's other types of remedies and resources available to them if in fact, for whatever reason, a law enforcement agency decides that it is not able to move forward with a criminal case because it's not cognizable under criminal law statutes, et cetera. So during the last council meeting, uh, we discussed the idea of sending a letter to law enforcement entities, agencies throughout the state of California to remind them and to work with them and to respectfully request that they identify these types of uh, opportunities to address these items. They're not criminal in nature through civil remedies, whether filing a complaint to the DFPH or other types of ways uh, under the Ralph Civil Rights Act. And so uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dale Brodsky, Councilman Brodsky and I put together a letter, which hopefully uh, our colleague Rachel Langston can put on share view or share screen. Um, and maybe if there's an opportunity for you all to review and provide comments now, or can everybody see it? Everybody's on com, on mute, but. Can't see it yet. And our, our goal in doing this letter was to keep it short and um, uh, direct um, so that it would get the attention of law enforcement offices um, and just to ask them um, if they could share with, with individuals who are either crime victims or others who they may come in contact with to share with them what options exist other than um, criminal as, as um, Chair Sandoval mentioned it's it, even when there are not criminal charges um, filed in a particular matter, it might be helpful to um, to individuals to receive information about what options they have, including contacting DFEH, including um, you know looking at civil Ralph Act violations, that kind of thing. And so we wanted to implore um, uh, officers in in who are in law enforcement to make this information available to individuals who they come into contact with. So that's our goal. Um, the letter's not final, but it's, we, we hope it's pretty close to final, but we would like your approval in, um, so that we can um, get this sent out. And in, in, there's, still, there's still some tweaking we could do. And if you 
see anything as you're reading through it quickly now, please let us know. Um, so thanks. Thank you very much. I, I really like this. I'm glad we're taking a step forward and that this looks really good. I just have one small proposed edit to the letter in the last sentence of the first paragraph, um, in the second to last line where it says, um, and inform victims of crime and the public about the variety of resources that are available. I would suggest saying resources and possible civil um, remedies, just because I'm thinking somebody reading this might think, oh, this is all about information they might get and, you know, where they can go and blood, but making, making it clear in the first paragraph that we're talking about, um, you know, civil remedies or, or, or civil lawsuits or wh however you want to phrase it. I think okay. that's a great idea. It's a good idea. And so I would suggest that we actually put it before, maybe like variety of civil remedies and resources. Okay. Council, uh, Council Member Iglesias, any additional comments? Council Member Hong, I see your hands raised. Uh, I just was going to ask if is this going to be sent out via email? Um, I think for ease, I would just uh, recommend that you just put hyperlinks um, so they can click and get to it without having to cut and paste. And so just make it into a hidden hyperlink. I know that you're explaining what the link is but I think you would get more traction and then you can see. Um, I think we've got the hyperlinks in there, do we not? They may not jump out in color the way that it's as a PDF, but definitely we'll do them as hyperlinks. Great, thank yeah, you. What you're suggesting, uh, Council Member Hong, is just to uh, identify the document and then create a hyperlink to that so they could press, as, opposed to, as opposed to putting the website there. Exactly. That makes sense, thank you. Any additional comment from fellow council members? Okay. Since the council already approved, uh, since uh, the council already approved this language, everybody have an agreement about this language and we have agreed last time. Okay. So um, great, we'll move forward with that then, the way that the language is currently drafted. Although there may be some tweaking as the former English teacher, I always find something new to edit. So, you know, just put up with that, but. Is that okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Okay, so we're moving forward. Anything else to add at this time? Any uh, public comment? There's no public comment. Okay. All right, so we're moving next uh, to an update from the Algorithms and Bias Hearing Subcommittee, uh, Council Members Tim Iglesias and Helen Hong. Yes, thank you, Chair. So um, Council Member Iglesias and I have been meeting with um, DFH staff, uh, specifically Rachel and with Muriel to talk about um, if there would be proposed language on how to update uh, the FIHA employment regulations to include relevant algorithm related modifications. So we are early on in this process. We're actually looking at the regulations to see how they would be incorporated to make sure that um, the relevant FIHA languages, uh, language includes machine learning and the like. Um, and so uh, we are uh, continuing to review and hopefully we'll be able to propose some um, modification to update that language uh, within the next several months. Thank you. And I would just add, I think, I think our plan is to do a similar thing with the housing regs. Thank you, council member. Any other comments from fellow council members? Any public comment? There are no public comments. Okay, great. Uh, we'll go next to um, the next agenda item. And this is with regard to uh, additional subcommittee assignments. Um, is there any... Uh... I do have a little bit. I just wanted to share a little bit about the CIFRA regs, um, which is okay. next, just real quick. Go ahead, council member. Um, since that was the, I think that was the agenda. I know. Um, just, uh, just piggybacking on what Director Kish said, the um, OAL did approve the regulations that we had voted on last time with a small change. 
um, and I, that's what I wanted to share with you um, that we had in our in the council had discussed the expanding the definition of parent in the context of parent in law to um, reference what was already how parent was defined um, previously and also in in consistent with uh, 1294.5.210, um, but OAL wanted to simplify it and so went back to the original um, new statutory language, which just defines parent in law as parent law means the parent of a spouse or domestic partner. So instead of the longer, more um, uh, detailed definition, it's back to the simple one. So with that change, um, it's been approved and um, it's not in your packet because the approval happened after the agenda went out. Thank you, council member. Any comments from fellow council members on this item? Great work getting it through. Any public comments? There are no public comments. Okay. Now we're going to the next agenda item. My apologies, Councilmember Brodsky, for skipping that agenda item. So we're moving forward to the uh, second to the last agenda item. Uh, so can we talk about a little bit about uh, additional subcommittee assignments? Anybody have any comments, any council members? Um, I just want to piggyback on what Councilmember Iglesias said, which is um, we're evaluating potential new housing regulations now that our package has been approved and it may be that um, some of those will be appropriate for a new subcommittee and not the subcommittee that currently includes um, council member Iglesias and I, maybe some combination of us. Um, it, so we should be able to have a report for everybody back by the next meeting, okay. I believe. Um, subcommittee for on UNRU? If it's going to take five years for packet of regulations to get out, you know, it might make sense to start if we don't. I th that's, um, that's not what, well, what council member Schur and I discussed, although I'm totally open to it and I feel it's absolutely necessary, um, but it's not something that, that, that we had discussed. So I'm not sure. I, th I think may maybe I'm not sure if this is the right time or not. Um, Director Kisher, Council Member Sandoval, you can let me know. But whether or not we're actually trying to form um, uh, the next set of subcommittees or see if we can form them, because I'm thinking one thing that I think um, Council Member Schur and I feel is it would be valuable to do um, a, a sort of a cleanup harmonizing uh, small uh, regulatory action on the first two sets of housing regulations, particularly the last one, and that she and I would serve on that, but, and it would really be limited to just harmonizing and clarifying um, issues that were, you know, kind of came up maybe at the last minute and weren't able to be included um, in the last regulation. So uh, that's one possibility. Okay. And I'd be interested in knowing if people are interested in other things. I mean, certainly under that, or a portion of under, that is a big undertaking. So yes, that, that is certainly something we at some point need to address. So just as a matter of process, um, the council has to act to form subcommittees. So I think, um, I apologize, I just got a leg cramp. Uh, the <laughs> council has to decide during this public meeting, um, if you want to create new subcommittees, and then take a vote to create them. And so now that the prior housing package has been approved um, to do more or different housing work, the council would have to vote um, today to form one or more subcommittees. So uh, I would propose uh, in response to what council member Shore has just said, that the council vote to convene a housing subcommittee to address Kind of clarification or cleanup of the existing regs, the two major packages that have moved through in the past couple of years. Um, and I would also propose if there's interest, by the way, taking a step back, you don't have to do any of this and the council can decide and has decided in the past to postpone or not consider forming a subcommittee on one or more topics. But I would propose a subcommittee um, to address clarification and cleanup of housing regs 
And I would propose a subcommittee to look at um, uh, real estate lending and restrictive covenants in the housing context um, to consider whether regulations are appropriate, to consider whether a public hearing is appropriate, um, just to kind of get that ball started. And then in response to Council Member Brodsky, um, we have contemplated forming an UNRU subcommittee in the past, and I think the council didn't vote to create it because of concerns about capacity, but certainly this is as appropriate a time as any to repropose a, um, a regulatory subcommittee on the UNRU Civil Rights Act that could then come back to the council with a set of proposals about how and whether to move forward, whether a broad package, a narrow package, or, or any other type of um, of action. So if that's something that folks are interested in, you propose it and then uh, people raise their hand to volunteer to be on the subcommittee and then the council votes to approve it. So let me propose a subcommittee to review and harmonize as necessary the existing two sets of housing regs and I would volunteer to be on that committee. And I would volunteer to serve also with uh, Council Member Schur on that committee. And I would propose an UNRU committee, but I'm not volunteering to be on the committee, but I think it's an important subcommittee to have and for people to get, get started on. Any interest on being on an UNRU committee for fellow council members? I, um, I would be interested in, in looking at it and sort of figuring out the scope of what may be possible. Okay. Anyone else? I'm also interested. Okay. Yeah. I, unfortunately, between my existing committee assignments, including 1135, I'm not feeling I can take something else on right now um, that's of the breadth of under, but certainly if proposals come out of it for pieces of it, I'd be interested in thinking about it. Thank you, council member. All right. I would, Go I would also be willing to serve with with somebody else, if somebody else is willing to help, on a, a committee to explore um, real estate lending restrictive covenants. Again, you know, from an exploratory standpoint, trying to determine whether or not we should do regs, and if so, what the scope of the regs would be. If somebody else would be interested in helping me out on that. <laughs> Can we have another uh, proposal? I, I've done a lot of reading on it recently, um, so I'm tempted. <laughs> um, if, if no one else wants to, I will, Tim. I've I done think... less than reading, but I'm happy to, to, to join. With why, don't you, why don't you go then, Helen? Julie, was that, was that is interest that I saw there too? Because I know Tim may be sick of me on algorithms as well. So if you want to mix it up, I wouldn't be offended as well. Um, I had just volunteered for the UNRU subcommittee. Um, so I'm happy to take that on. Helen, I think it would be great to work with you. Okay, all right. <laughs> so then I'll, I'll, do, I'll, do the, I'll do the real estate restrictive covenants with you exploratory work. I'm and happy and to let me that. say one of the issues to consider there um, as part of this is discriminatory appraisals, which are getting a lot of um, attention at the moment. Um, and whether, you know, among the various, that is a, a fairly broad topic. Um, and there's lots of pieces we could bite off or not bite off. So, I, and that's just one of them in the, the committee. Um, it would be great if Councilmember Glacius and Councilmember Harm could take a look at that as among the other things that we might be looking at there. Mm -hmm. Sure. Any other proposals? Yeah, I would also use this opportunity to talk about uh, the additional uh, duties and responsibilities that the council has and want to get feedback from uh, other council members. We know that we have regulatory rulemaking authority uh, under the statute on regulations, et cetera. But I also wanted to convey uh, that there are other items that we can do that really moves forward issues of civil rights um, under 1104. Uh, for example, make inquiries into general discrimination problems and issue informal and formal findings, including published reports, 
uh, establish such advisory agencies and councils as will assist in fostering goodwill, cooperation and conciliation among groups and elements of the population of the state through studies, conciliations, hearings, which we've done and of course recommendations to the council. Uh, and then issue publications, results of inquiries and research and reports to the governor and to the legislature uh, that in its judgment will tend to aid in effectuating the purpose of the Fair Employment and Housing Act, promote goodwill, cooperation and conciliation and minimize or eliminate unlawful discrimination or advance civil rights in the state of California. So there are a lot of different items and initiatives that this council can also uh, perform in the interest of civil rights advancement in the state of California. Uh, and I would like to request that my fellow council members think about it and ruminate about it uh, as about what else can we do uh, in ways that maybe have not been done in the past that really moves the agenda forward, uh, but also uh, is one that is reflective of our, our broad, um, albeit limited, but broad uh, purpose of really trying to bring uh, issues of civil rights to the forefront, spotlight issues of concerns, uh, and make recommendations. So. Number one is for my colleagues to think about it. Uh, you know, what is more that we can do? And then two, does this deserve or should it deserve uh, a subcommittee to really flesh out and bring out proposals back to the council during this next meeting? So I leave it there. Any feedback on that? I think it's, a, it's really important. We, the hearings we've held have had an impact. And I've learned a lot. So I think there's a lot of work we can do in our educational and community connections roles. I agree with that as well. I, I, I don't feel uh, that I have enough bandwidth to serve on that committee now, but I, I think it's a really valuable thing to, to expand and to just explore the various ways that the council can act. I think what we can do is uh, think about it. Uh, my hope is that we have a uh, meeting uh, that is uh, the next uh, several weeks or months, um, you know, and, and I think we will. Uh, and, and then formalize then, you know, what is it that, uh, who wants to serve on the committee? If in fact, someone does want to fit, sit on the committee, I would like to serve on that committee. Uh, and then we can kind of explore what we can do and, and, uh, and we can decide that at that time. Sandoval, I mean, I agree with you. I think part of the question that I have is, you know, what are our priorities as a, as a council in terms of if we create a subcommittee, should there be a goal of a public education or a public mobilization piece um, for each subcommittee or kind of what is our goal overall? Because in a way, like the hate committee or whatever sub subcommittee that we should be on, we should be having one of these goals, should we not? And so I think that's the kind of disconnect that I'm feeling is, how does public education or engagement um, relate to any of the subcommittee work that we do? And should we then identify, I don't know, um, those? I, I, think it's I don't think it's either or binary. Yeah. I think that each subcommittee can think about how they could impact that particular area in which they're focusing on and natural kind of connections with stakeholders and others to move the agenda forward uh, and, and maybe even present that during meetings uh, to a committee of its form, subcommittee that's formed that deals specifically with these additional issues of, of uh, what I would say more community focused, community engagement, uh, maybe dealing with some hot spots of concerns that we could act more uh, in a focused way, obviously in, in partnership and in collaboration with what the DFH is doing so that we're not doing something that's duplicative, but uh, almost like an umbrella type of entity that is in charge of and looking at ways that we could uh, identify and highlight uh, informational materials and education for the public at large so that we also um, uh, serve our role of educating the public uh, to exercise their rights, uh, but also learn from the public about what are some of the issues of concerns that they have in different sectors, in different communities, in different regions of the state of California in a more coherent way. I completely agree with you. Um, and obviously I would be very interested in that, particularly from the community engagement standpoint, um, because I think uh, that is true in terms of most people are not gonna be engaging with legal aid and or law enforcement. And so what are the, what are the uh, resources they have? Um, I guess my question would be like, in terms of how does this uh, align with the department's goals in terms of their outreach work? And then how do we align? But I totally agree with you. I, I would, um, be very interested in this kind of subcommittee. So I'll leave it at that. 
And the idea is to augment what the DFH is already doing uh, and complement. Uh, um, and you know, we all are in different areas of California, so we might have different uh, connections to different communities and different uh, items of concern related to civil rights advancement. Um, this is Dara. Uh, I agree. I think it's really important to do that work and to do it in a focused way, um, like the hate crimes hearings that we had in the work group doing building on that. Um, I also know that when we set up committees that deal primarily with a regulatory issue, which is the scope, we, at least for me, it doesn't end when the regs get adopted. We do a ton of community education. DFH is doing a huge webinar series on the housing regulations. It reaches hundreds and hundreds of people in a broad cross section of the community, not just the people who normally would read the regulations. So I, I do think there's different kinds of educational outreach um, and different roles. And I, I agree we can, I would love to see a committee that focused on, you know, what are some of the most brought to us for discussion, some suggestions about what are the critical issues where we should be more engaged at a community level in addition to the other education that we do. Um, so I really support that. Um, I, I had a thought about a subcommittee, but I want to finish this first. So, okay. Uh I don't remember you had your hand up. I was just going to uh, make a similar point as council member Schur and um, lift up the Fair Housing webinar series, which is a great collaboration between the council and the department. And um, as our outreach and education team at the department does more and more programming, um, I will be glad to work to incorporate council members as you are available into that work. It would be great to do um, even more together. Thank you, Adam. Any other comments? Council Member Sure, you had another idea about a proposed subcommittee? Yes, but I, I didn't know if we closed the loop. Did did we have a subcommittee that included Council Member Hong and 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 perhaps the chair or others to take a look at the next, you know, big we're to bring back for discussion some ideas for where our focus should be for more deeper outreach. Or uh, I, I guess the, my my initial thought is we could form a committee now, and I would, I would love to serve on it with Councilmember Hong if if she would like to join me, or we could wait and kind of think through about and have a more focused kind of here's what we're thinking about doing, and create the committee in the next at the next hearing. Uh, but I, I think there's no reason to wait. I would be more than happy to create it now uh, with with the support of somebody else, of course. I don't have an opinion, I just want to close the loop. I think um, if uh, council members Sandoval and Hong are willing to do it, I think it'd be valuable to form the subcommittee now so they could do some little bit of thinking about it and brainstorming with each other. And then at the next council meeting, maybe present, you know, an outline of ideas or whatever, because I think it's going to be more productive use of our time to be responding to some thought through possibilities. Obviously, that outline or whatever would be based in a conversation with the department in, you know, and, and integrated from the get go of what the department is already doing. Councilmember Hong, how do you feel about that? I'm down with it. I'm down. Like, I think I'm down with it means yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kevin, were you going to jump in with something? No, I just wanted to add that um, just because we form a subcommittee doesn't mean that the subcommittee has to exist in perpetuity, right? Like you can form a subcommittee, come back with a set of proposals, disband the subcommittee, and form different subcommittees to carry forward some or all of the proposals. So. Um, on this one, I think it's helpful for you all to be able to, for two of you to be able to talk to one another um, without necessarily taking on the entire obligation of, for example, planning a public hearing, which could then be presented to the council as a proposal that we could form a different subcommittee on. Thanks, Director right, Kish. All right. Um, I think we've closed the loop now. Council Member Schur. I just had a question for Director Kish. I was really impressed with the 
child care and housing publication uh, the, the child care providers and housing the the work you had done around that issue and um I didn't know if you thought there was room for regulation in that arena. Or you don't need to answer that on the spot. It's just, I wanted to throw it yeah. out for consideration. One of the reasons why the um, inclusion of child care protections in fair housing law is little understood and confusing is because the actual substantive protections are in the health and safety code. But the health and safety code says that its provisions are enforced through the Fair Employment and Housing Act. Um, and this comes out of a case that found that discrimination against a child care provider was um, under the UNRU Act and the Fair Housing Act discrimination on the basis of occupation, on the basis of source of income, familial status, um, gender, possibly race. So it's a complicated area. Um, and by the way, I should say that uh, all the kudos go to Adam and his team, as well as the Child Care Law Center that was an important partner in putting together uh, the materials. So I think, it's, I think it's complex. I don't know as I sit here today whether regulations would be helpful or whether indeed this council would have um, plenary authority over the protections since they appear in the Health and Safety Code, but certainly it's something that you could uh, form a subcommittee to investigate further if you were inclined to do that. Thank you. Just wanted to throw it out at this point. Appreciate that answer um, for folks to think about down the road. So I, I sort of have my hands full at the moment, but I was just curious. Thank you, council member. Any other proposals? Okay. Um, so I'll read off the uh, committee, the subcommittees have been formed. Uh, we have a subcommittee to clean up uh, and, and synchronize and harmonize the housing regulations. And that is gonna be with council members Iglesias and council member Shure. We also, of all, I'm sorry for inter in, intra interjecting. Um, I do think there has to be a vote to form the subcommittees. Right, so can they, oh, okay. can they identify what the subcommittees are first and then we vote? Yes, sorry, I misunderstood. Okay, so let's let's take that to a vote. Can we have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, roll call. Chair Sandoval. Aye. Councilmember Brodsky. Aye. Councilmember Hong. Aye. Councilmember Iglesias. Aye. Councilmember Alude. Aye. Councilmember Schur. Aye. Council Member Walensky. Aye. Great. Thank you to the new subcommittee, subcommittee members. Uh, next up, we have a new subcommittee on uh, UNRU, uh, and that is with uh, Council Member Walensky and Council Member Alude. So, do we have a motion on that? I move. I move. Second. Second. Okay. <laughs> Either one. Roll call, please. Chair Sandoval? Aye. Council Member Brodsky? Aye. Council Member Hong? Aye. Council Member Iglesias? Aye. Council Member Alude? Aye. Council Member Schur? Aye. Council Member Walensky? Aye. Great. Congratulations on the subcommittee members. Uh, we'll move next to subcommittee that is uh, focused on uh, real estate and restrictive covenants, uh, and also uh, discrimination that may present itself uh, with regard to appraisals as raised by Council Mishra as an issue to be looked at. Um, and uh, that is gonna be uh, uh, Michael Iglesias, is that correct? As well as Council Member Helen Hong. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, can we have a motion on that, please? So moved. Second. Second. Chair Sandoval? Aye. Council Member Brodsky? Aye. Council Member Hong? Aye. Council Member Iglesias? Aye. Council Member Alude? Aye. Council Member Schur? Aye. Council Member Walensky? Aye. 
Great. Uh, and then the last subcommittee uh, with Council Member Hong and um, and uh, and me, we'll, we have a subcommittee that I'll call uh, Community Education Outreach, but it really speaks to additional responsibilities or opportunities under Section 11004. Uh, 11 um, so can we have a motion on that? So moved. A second? Second. Great. Roll call, please. Chair Sandoval. Aye. Councilmember Brodsky. Aye. Councilmember Hong. Aye. Councilmember Iglesias. Aye. Councilmember Alude. Aye. Councilmember Schur. Aye. Councilmember Walensky. Aye. Great. Uh, finally, the last agenda item. Is there any further public comment on any item? No, there's not any further public comment. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a splendid rest of the week. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you.